Wow, welcome. We are glad that you have joined us today. For those of you on campus and those of you are joining us through Church at Home, we are really thrilled that you are here. Today we continue through the Book of Romans. We are truly one church meeting in many locations, and, and we are glad that you're joining us however you are today, or maybe you're going to watch us later in the week and, and take in the teaching. But grab your Bibles, turn to the Book of Romans, chapter 7. We're going to get there in a moment. Two things I want to rem- I do with you d- real quick, and one is this. Um, first is that we're asking you to bring back your Thanksgiving bags uh, next Sunday for us or bring them by during the week, and this one is absolutely full. And they, if you didn't pick up one, we still have some in the lobby that you can grab today and have this week to pick up already. And we are feeding 200 families a full Thanksgiving meal this year because of your generosity. And we want to say thank you that you've done this for the past number of years and um, we're going to, to you know, we're buying a, a well over a ton of turkeys and all those kinds of things and pies and stuff. So please bring your bags back if you have them next week so we can get all those ready, get them to aim, and they can distribute them for Thanksgiving. And I want to say thank you for your generosity. Thank you for being such a powerful, generous church in these areas uh, of giving. Uh, so thank you so much. Now, the other thing is that my, sw- my sweet Selah is here somewhere here she is. She's all the way in the back, and I have to show her to you. And I do this for all new babies, um, and it, this is a special one for me, I have to say. Okay, come here, baby girl. All right. Got her? Okay. There you go. Okay, it's okay. It's, uh, this is Papa. So hang on, hang on. Okay. Shh, 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 shh. Uh, this is our third grandchild, okay? And um, this is Sayla. And uh, she belongs to uh, Brad and Marcy Gescu. <laughs> that is awesome, isn't it? Yes. That's good until you hear that at like 3 o'clock in the morning, right? Okay, it's okay. It's okay. Here comes Grams. Here comes Grams. Shh, shh, shh. Okay. It's okay. It's okay. All right. All right. Well... Just a moment. We were going to actually pray for her if she cooperates. Cause this is, okay, there you go. There you go. Hey, girl. Okay, there you go. Now, <sighs> I just don't have the touch. I guess that's what it is, right? Yes, that's what it is. But this is Selah, and we wanted to introduce Selah Gray to you this morning, and she is going to cry. <laughs> this is wonderful. I love it. I love it. Okay. Okay, there it is. Okay, here we go. Here we go. It's the passy, right? Yes. Some of you need a passy at times in your life too. Isn't that correct? Yes, yes. So it must be it. Let's pray for her real quick. Father, we are so thankful for Selah. Thank you for uh, blessing our family with her and for us as a faith family, blessing us with her, her life and allowing all of us to have the opportunity to see her grow into a woman that loves you with all of her heart, soul, mind, and spirit. And so, Father, we pray over her today, and we bless her. We bless Brad and Marcy as you have loaned her to them and that you would use them powerfully in her life and raising her. Thank you for her. Bless her today, God. And we're so thankful to have her in church for the very first time this morning. In your name, amen. Are we good now? Good. 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 My prayers tend to put people to sleep anyway, right? So that's okay. Yes, let's give Selah a hand this morning. First time. That is my own granddaughter, okay? This is the funny thing, right? My, she's thinking, this is Papa, so I can do whatever I want. That's right, yes. So thank you for being here. Grab your Bibles this morning. Turn to the book of Romans, chapter 7, and we'll continue our study together in, in a few moments. Now, let me, let me give you a little background as to where we are, because chapter 7 is so pivotal in what we do. In fact, what we understand about chapter 7 is that Paul sort of makes a transition in his study with you and I, and he's basing this on what we have learned thus far in this first six chapters. And so he's going to move into something a little deeper with us about our lives, But what we realize and what we discovered is before conversion, sin dominated our lives. In fact, Paul uses the term that you and I were given over to sin. And what that means is this, that we couldn't help from sinning, that that simply we could not stop from that. It was the dominant power of our lives. It influenced our actions. 
It influenced our thoughts, everything about us, and influenced that. Where was Christ during this time in our life? He's in the margins of our life. And he's in the margins of our life, but he's drawing us by his loving kindness. He's wooing us. He's bringing us to him in our, in our, in this, in a, to create a relationship with us. And so what happens is this. Through that drawing of his loving kindness, we come to this realization at some point in our life that we need Jesus. We need a Savior within our life. And we come to that point, and so we simply um, we have that moment of conversion within our lives. And so what happens, there's a change of power. So Christ becomes the dominant power of our life. He becomes that power that influences our thoughts, our minds, and all of our actions. Well, what happens to sin? Sin goes away, and we never have to deal with it again in our life. Well, that's not true, right? Sin goes to the margins of our life. And so that is sin does not powerless, but yet sin no longer dominates our life. So sin is there in the margins of our life, you and I, tempting us continually at times, yes, more than, sometimes more than others, but it does no longer dominate us. And But at times we discovered last week in our teaching that we try to domesticate sin, you know, as believers, and this is not that of doubting your salvation, but as believers, we allow sin to come back in at times in our life. We fall to temptation. And so we try to domesticate that and give it space within our life. And what we realized is that domesticating sin within our life is like trying to domesticate a wild animal in our own home, right? That they're always predators, never, have, never will change regardless of how long you have them in captivity. They're always going to be predators. And we said last week, it's like us having an 800-pound gorilla as a pet because at some point, he's going to see you as food. Isn't that right? Yeah, he's going to see you as food. And so we try to domesticate that. And so what we find in our life, with Christ as the center and the controlling power of our lives, with sin out in the margins of our life, that it seems like that, well, there's almost like two of us. There's the part of us that always wants to do the right thing, you know? And then there's the part of us that simply wants to do what we feel is right. And those are two different things in life. They are. Those are really two different things in life. And the question that we have, I think, is this. How do we transition between the two of those? How do I transition between the part of me that really sincerely, and I use that word intentionally, that sincerely desires to obey God. There's that part of me that wants to obey God with all sincerity. But then there's also the part of me that wants to do what I want to do regardless of the cost. And, and so, and, and that part of me that wants to do whatever it wants to do regardless of the cost is just as sincere, is just as sincere as the part that wants to do the right thing. Now, I don't want to devalue this in our life. It's important, I think, because I think sometimes we look at this part of us that wants to do whatever it wants to do regardless of the cost, and we see how sincere it is, but I think we also miss the sincerity of that if we really want to obey God. So in light of that, it's a struggle. It's a huge struggle. That's chapter 7 of the book of Romans. He moves us from this point where he says to us, hey, that before conversion, that sin was the centering power of your life. And so it influenced everything about you. At conversion, then there is this power change within your life. Christ becomes that centering part of your life. Sin moves to the margins of your life. And so that's where many of you are today. And he's saying, but yet there's still a struggle in my life with the two of me. It's almost like I'm schizophrenic in some way, right? There's two of me. One of me sincerely wants to do what God wants me to do. And one of me sincerely wants to do whatever I want to do regardless of, of the cost. That is chapter 7. And so how do I struggle for righteousness? That's it. How do I struggle for righteousness in a world that is simply seemingly designed for unrighteousness? How do I struggle when there seems to be two of me? That one that sincerely wants to do the right thing, and the other that sincerely wants to do whatever it wants to do regardless of the cost. So how do I struggle for righteousness? It's Romans chapter 7, verse 1, and it says this, Or do you not know brothers? He calls us brothers. When Paul does that, he wants our attention. So he says this to you and I, or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. So what I chose this thought to start out with is a question. 
Do you not know, brothers and sisters? It's Paul's question. What is he talking about? And I think he's used this word law a couple of times in this very first verse. So what do we know about the law? What do we know about what he's talking about this morning? Here's the law. The law is a marker. It's a marker as to how you stand with God. It's the way that the Christians that in, in the church in Rome looked because of their background in Judaism, that what they said is this, that the more I keep the law, then the more God loves me and the higher stand I have and higher place I have with God. And so what God does, God knows that even that kind of thinking still is lodged in our hearts and our minds. We still deal with this thought. Whether even subconsciously at times, and not even actually putting it into to words, that we live our lives trying to absolutely create a higher standing with God, as if somehow we are scoring points with Him, and God is keeping score within our lives. And what we have learned through all of this teaching is that God knows us, and He saw that problem in my life and your life. And what does he do? He sends Christ into the world as a fulfillment of the law, not to abolish the law, but yet to fulfill the law, a law that you and I could not fulfill within our life, so that now the law is not the marker of my life, but yet Christ becomes the marker of my life. Not a a list of rules and regulations, but it's Christ. So I can breathe for a moment. I can. I can just take a really deep breath. Because Paul has taught us that no one is justified, no one is justified in this room and ever has been justified through their works. No one has ever been justified through their works and through keeping the law. Chapter 3 taught us that. He said simply this, that righteousness comes only by faith within our lives. He gave us this powerful example back in a few chapters of that of Abraham. And what he said about Abraham is this, that righteousness was credited to Abraham because of his faith. Not because of his works, but righteousness was given to Abraham because of his faith. And I think that's so powerful. Because when you see Abraham's life, he doesn't do everything right, does he? Absolutely not. No, he's the guy that lies about Sarah, his wife, and says to two kings that she is his sister. That never goes good. I know we've said that so many times, but it really is a powerful point. It is. Yeah, he's the guy who who simply listens to his wife, Sarah. And, and guys, if you're married, can I tell you, there's nothing wrong with listening to your wife. In fact, it's very smart. It absolutely is, right? It's, it's a wise thing to do. Our, our wives are much more sensitive in areas of our life than, than, than many times we are. And, and they speak the truth when we don't want to hear the truth at times. And we have to swallow real hard. Yes. Can I get an amen from all the men in the room? Yes, you know that's true. And some of you are thinking, no, I don't want to say amen to that, Mark. I, did, I really don't. Yes. But his, Sarah comes to him, and what does she say? Hey, God has given us a promise. We've got to help God out here, right? He shouldn't have listened then. And so here's Hagar, and you go in and have a relationship with Hagar, and then we're going to fulfill God's promise. We're going to help God out, and they have Ishmael. So what the beauty of this is that their righteousness <clears throat> excuse me, is given or credited to Abraham because of his faith. And then so what Paul does, he says, come on, brothers, let me have a talk with you. It's like he brings us to, you know, this, uh, this secluded space, and it's private, and he puts his arm around me, and he says, hey, I want to share something with you, and I want you to hear this, because you got to know this before you go any further in any of my teachings. you got to understand this. He wants to remove any doubt in our life about our relationship with Christ, and, and, and he wants to say this to us, That, listen, you know that you're converted. You know there's been this power shift in your life, but you're still struggling with the markers of your life. You're still struggling with what marks you and what defines you. And and he's he's saying to you and I that God has made a way beyond the law, is what he's saying. He's made a way beyond the law, beyond the regulations, beyond the rules that would define us of our standing with God. That's what he's saying. It delivers us from a relationship based upon works. And he says this, do you not know? you got to know this. Before you go any further, do you not know? Because this is where your freedom starts. You've had this experience. You understand that sin no longer dominates your life. But if you want to be free, and if you want to live a life in freedom, then you have to get this, he says. 
And he says that the law is binding on a person. He says this in verse 1, binding on a person only as long as he lives. The law has authority over you, what he's saying, as long as you live. So the only way for you to escape the law, the only way for you to ever escape the law, the heaviness of the law and sin in your life, he said prior to conversion, prior to Christ coming into your life, was to die. The only way you're going to get relief in life is to die. Now, I don't know if you've had that feeling about life recently, okay? I don't know. But if you've had, then you need to talk to someone, and that's serious. You really need to have a conversation with me or a staff member or someone that you trust about the way you're feeling. But what he's saying here is this, that prior to your conversion, prior to Christ coming into the world, that the only relief from sin and law was you to die. And when I say that, you can feel the heaviness of the law and the heaviness of sin, and it was only escapable through death, but through Christ's death, he died that death for you and I. This is a beautiful thought that he shares with us. It's through that act of redemption, that it's our, our conversion through faith and not works it is. And, and so what I realize is that we are free. We don't have to die to be free from the heaviness and the bondage of regulations that always reminds us of our failures and our guilt and our faults. We don't have to say, well, someday I'm going to die and I'm going to be free of that. You can be free of that now in this life. That's what he's saying. And, and you're sitting here, and, you know, God is providential, right? So you're here because God brought you here. You said, well, I got up this morning, and I made the effort to be here. But if we believe that God is sovereign and providential, then you are here because God brought you here today. And you're sitting here dealing with guilt and shame in your life. You're sitting here dealing with great remorse within your life. And what Paul is teaching us today is this. That we don't have to die to get away from that. We don't have to punch out of this life to get some relief within us is what he's saying. That because of Christ's coming for you and I, because of the conversion experience within our lives, that we are free to love God and we are free to receive his love back and to follow him in love and obedience and serve him no longer out of fear, but out of love. It's about freedom. And freedom is not just about you doing what you want to do. That's not it at all. Freedom is simply about you and I being free from shame and guilt that no longer masters our lives. It no longer masters our lives. That was the tool of the law. That's what it did. Because you never could make the standard. You never could reach the mark. So you constantly lived by this motivation of fear and shame within your life. And what Paul is saying is, hey, you, you have died to that. That you don't, you don't have to have a physical death to get away from that. He goes on to say in verse 2, he says this, For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. And boy, I could have skipped over that those two verses, couldn't I? Yeah, I could have like, whoop, let's go on. Let's go down to verse four. Let's not do two and three. But they're important. They're important. So I want you to Take a deep breath for a moment because those words, for some of you, just brought a huge load of rejection and condemnation and guilt on your life. Can I tell you, reject that. Reject it. And here's why. Because context is everything. Where this verse is placed in the text is absolutely, it's important that you and I understand this. This is the law of the Torah. Understand that. If you notice how many times in these two verses that Paul uses the very word law, we understand that what this is. This is an illustration. This is a metaphor is what this is. This is not a dogmatic statement concerning marriage for you and I. The point is, it's the lifelong nature of marriage that he's dealing with. It's what he's dealing with. It's the lifelong nature of something. This is not a declarative statement concerning marriage. And I want you to know that. I don't want you to leave this place thinking that's what this is. But it does refer to a basic rule of marriage. And at, 
It's the point that every marriage starts out. It's not that every marriage ends there, but it's the point that every marriage starts out. And the point that every marriage starts out is what? That this is for life. Isn't that right? Yes. You, I have never done a ceremony where I said to the couple, the sweet couple, you know, that you're going to care for each other in sickness and health for a minimum of 10 years. Do you agree? You know, and they say, I will. I've never had that stipulation placed in, in the ceremony. Why? Because the nature of marriage is for a lifetime. Now, I understand that doesn't always work that way. I realize that. And for that in our life, there is grace. And for that in our life, that there is mercy. And I understand that there are all types of circumstances involved in relationships that don't make it a lifetime. But he's talking about the nature of marriage is what he's talking about. And he applies that to our relationship with that of the law and sin. And he sees us in this bondage that the only way that we can get rid of the shame of our life, the only way that we can get rid of the guilt of our life is to die, is what it was. And so he says, I'm going to bring some relief to you. I'm going to release you from the law. I'm going to release you from sin. He's using this illustration to show how we were bound to that, is what he's saying. The only freedom we had was death. And he's saying to us today that you're no longer bound to a life of shame. You're no longer bound to a life of guilt. You're no longer bound to those in the shadow of regulations and rules that you could never keep and you could never meet the mark within your life. No matter how hard you try, Jesus dies. He releases us from that. And so what Paul tells us, that we are now free from one to belong to another. And I, and I feel within my heart this morning that there are many of you that are sitting right here in this very room and you're, you're sitting here under a load of guilt because of your past. You're not doubting your salvation. You're not doubting your conversion. You say that God is the center of your life. You're standing on that. The sin is out in the margins of your life. Hey, it comes in and out as we allow it to at times within our life. Absolutely, we understand that. And for that, there's grace and mercy but yet you are dealing with such great shame and great guilt because you don't meet expectations and you're dealing with those things within your life. And what Paul is specifically addressing with us today is that you don't have to wait until you die to be free from that. Look at verse 4. Likewise, my brothers, you also who have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another. That we've died to the law so that we may belong to another. To him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit of God. That when we talk about the law, what is Paul referring to? And I think we use this a lot, the word law, and we see it as just a very distant theological reference to that of the Mosaic law that they carried, the Levitical law that they lived by, but yet we see it very detached from our own lives today. And as Paul talked about the nature of marriage, not necessarily the specific rule of marriage, then what I think also contextually Paul is talking about here, he's talking about the very nature of the law. What is the nature of the law? And you say, Mark, come on, I, I, you know, I don't live by the Torah. That's not what I live by today. So what does this have to do with me? And, and you know, and, and the reality is I didn't come for some theological discourse. I come for something that's going to help me Monday morning when I get up within my life. And this is it. The law is a standard that we think proves our worth and gains acceptance with God and even with others within our lives. It is. The law is a standard that we think proves our worth and gains acceptance with God and sometimes even with others around us. If we refer back to this marriage illustration, that we're bound to that kind of thinking. Outside of Christ, that we're bound to that kind of thinking. We're bound to the heaviness of that kind of lifestyle until we die, is what Paul is teaching us. That's the way that we live before our conversion. And, and you think, well, maybe that stuff just doesn't bother me, that I'm not struggling with that, of, of that 
finding worth or gaining acceptance. I'm not struggling with that. So for those of you that have an exemption to the book of Romans in the room this morning, and for those of you that have made Martin Luther, the father of the Reformation, a liar because it doesn't apply to you today, then you know what? I think you really need to pray about that because just your very statement alone says that you are striving for that of worth and acceptance in your life. Because before this transition of power, that worth and acceptance and that desire and seeking that, man, it drove us. It was dominant within our lives. It's how we established our identity. Then Christ comes in. He becomes the dominant force and becomes our identity. But this struggle with that of seeking worth and gaining confidence and acceptance in life, that it remains in the margins of our life. It doesn't go away. We struggle with that. We struggle with this thought of, are we enough? Because that's always what the law was about. The law was always pushing us or always questioning us, placing us that place of guilt and shame because we're not enough. So the question was, are we enough? Are we enough? So I wrote some things down about that. I I just want to be honest with you about this, okay? So I wrote some things down about being enough because I said, Lord, just help me to understand where people are today in their life. And so these are the things I wrote down that I think probably would touch some of your lives this morning. The first is this, what you're thinking and where you, where you find your worth and the, where you find your acceptance is this, you're a good enough Christian. That's what you say, I'm a good enough Christian, right? That God is going to love me, God is going to care for me because I'm a good enough Christian. It's where you establish your worth and gain your acceptance. But what about those days when you are a bad Christian? I never have those days. Ah, then you're a liar. Let's talk about that, right? Yes. What about those moments? I think where we struggle, we're struggling with those things in the margins of our life. We are. Sin's not dominating us, but we're struggling with these issues out in the margins of our life that am I enough? Are you being enough? You're a good enough student. Yes, you're a good enough student. That's where you find your worth and that's where you find your acceptance. But what happens when you're not good enough in that area, right? What happens when you make your first B? You say, Mark, go lower. What happens when you make your first C? Mark, a little lower, right? What happens when you first D? If you're going below an F, you just didn't show up, right? That was it, right? You just, I didn't show up. But what if that's where you're looking for your worth and your acceptance in life? Well, I have enough talent and I have enough gifting, but what happens when those things fail? Because they do. Well, I'm a good enough spouse, man. And there's so much pressure in that area, isn't it? Well, I'm a good enough spouse or I'm a good enough mom or good enough dad or daughter or a son. But what happens when you don't meet the expectations? What happens? It's guilt. And the Bible said that when we live under the law, that that guilt was only escapable by death. You've worked hard. I mean, you've made a good living. You're keeping everybody around you as well as you can, happy and comfortable. But what happens when you can't? What happens when you're not good enough? You're good enough in your profession. You're good enough in your, your vocation. But what happens when you don't make the cut in one of those areas of your life? And, and I look at this thing and I realize that before Christ, they were locked into that until death is what the scripture tells us. And if I'm good enough in these areas of my life, then I'm okay. And then the future is going to be okay. And everybody's going to be happy around me. And it's such a powerful load for you and I to continually live under. And Paul says we're bound to that, unto death, inescapable outside of Christ. And you say, so Mark, when we get saved and we're converted, then the struggle goes away. No, it does not go away. That's the reality of life. It doesn't go away. It's no longer dominant. It's moved to the margins. Yes, it is, but it's not powerless. It still has power against us, but God has made a path for freedom, is what he's saying. He's made a path for freedom. They were not doomed to this bondage until death, is what he's saying. We're freed from one, he said in the scripture, to belong to another. And I realize it's messy, and I realize it's imperfect. Oh, and I realize that I'm not always consistent in these areas of my life. 
But I understand it's about process. That God has released me. I don't have to die to be free from the guilt and shame that I don't meet the standard anymore. God makes a way. God makes a way. Paul says, hey, you got to know this. I mean, you got to lock this deep in your heart. This is the foundation that you build the rest of your spiritual existence on, he says. Verse 5 says this, For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. You think, you know, you can write out beside that, what in the world is Paul talking about? I mean, it seems to be crazy here, but now we are released from the law, having died to that which, which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. And verse 7 says this in our last verse today, What then shall we say? That the law is sin? And he puts a question mark about it. Yet, he says, by no means. Yet, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. I'm confused, right? What is he talking about? For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said you shall not covet. And I'm confused. It's a redeeming element found through the law for you and I. He said sinful passions that were aroused by the law. And you say, wait a minute. So the law caused me to sin. So what I'm going to say is this. The more you tell me what not to do, the more I'm going to do. Right? Isn't that it? Yes. So I'm going to work that with my parents. And it's going to start today because we believe that Paul said that. And so the more that they tell me not what to do, I'm going to begin to do that because it's actually a good thing in my life per Paul. And that's not what he's saying at all. So, sorry. You can't use that. He's not saying the law is sin. What he's saying about the law is the law makes my sin visible, is what he's saying. And there's something very redeeming about that for our lives. Because what I see, even God, in his amazing ability to take things in life that are harmful to us and actually make them beautiful moments of our life, he takes the law which you and I were doomed to to death in guilt and shame because we could never make the standard. And he says, I can even take something like that. A struggle that we all have a standard that we can't meet. And I can make something beautiful in your life through that. Because the revealing of your sin, the contrast between you and that of the standard, causes you to know without any doubt in your life that you need a Savior and you're not it. How could we ever doubt that we were not on God's mind from the very beginning. How could you and I doubt that we are not continually on the mind of God when we see things like this in Scripture? You see, here's the law, and you wonder what the mirror is for. The law is like a mirror, and I realize the room is a different shape for everybody to see this, but I hope you can maybe get a a view of it in a moment. The mirror reveals what? The reality of who we are, right? Mirrors don't lie. They do. (laughs) Sometimes, right? They make you look bigger than you are or slimmer than you are, you know? And so what do you do? You always search the one that makes you look slimmer than you are, yeah? And so the law is like a mirror. But it just doesn't reveal who you are. What it does, it reveals a standard that you should come in line with. So if you have a mirror at home like this, and you were to draw an outline, and I'm no artist, okay, so please don't critique this, right? You would draw an outline. (laughs) I know, I know. Stick to preaching, Mark, okay? I, I know. There. I went. No. 
<clears throat> That's a sad version. I, I agree. Can everyone see that? Can you see it? I really feel very unaccepted of you laughing at my artwork right now, okay? Just want to know that. And so here's what happens in our lives. We're converted, yes. Sin is in the margins of our life. But we have this mirror, and it may not be a physical mirror in your home, but it's something that you carry with you all the time. And in this mirror is this outline. This is God's standard. And so what I find myself doing is I find myself standing in front of this all the time and trying to make the lines match up, you know? And for some reason, they just don't, no matter how I suck it in and push my chest out, it just doesn't line up. And so every day I go to that mirror and I do that. And when I walk away, I'm not like, woohoo, this is wonderful. I don't line up again today. No, what do I do, right? I have guilt and shame in my life because I messed up this week and I didn't get something right. I did something that I told God I would never do again. And so I'll walk away from that not meeting the standard of that outline of what I should be. And I leave with a lot of guilt. And I leave with a lot of shame within my life. So here's what I do. I'm going to be a better person. I'm going to change my behavior is what I'm going to do. That's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to be a nicer person to people. I'm going to treat people in a better way. I'm going to make some behavioral changes within my life. And what we do is we begin to dig a deeper hole for our lives. That's exactly what we do. Because this is not about us, this is about a Savior. Because this can be extremely depressing, can it, outside the scope of Jesus. It can be extremely depressing if this is where you're trying to find your worth and this is where you're trying to find your acceptance. But this idea of the real of my life and where I am, I have to understand that. There's value in me knowing really where I am in my relationship with God. And there's value in me knowing what the ideal of a relationship with God should look like within my life. So there's value within all of that. There is. But what I realize is this, this distance between the ideal of my life and the ideal that where God wants me to be is saturated with love and grace and mercy and kindness. Understand that. It's not what the law would have taught you. That you try to just work harder and do more and go back and correct all the mistakes of your life and make sure you don't do it again. Because if you do it again, maybe God will not be as merciful the next time within your life. No, but this journey is saturated with God's love and grace and mercy. Because why? Because God is absolutely committed to seeing through what he has started within Mark and within you. So today, even though I'm broken, <laughs> and I don't, I don't, I can't fit in there no matter what I do, you know, it's just not going to work. That even though I'm broken, my brokenness does not define me. That I'm sinful, but my sin does not define me today. Christ lives within me. Listen, maybe you're divorced. Your divorce doesn't define you. Understand that. Maybe you've been unfaithful in life. Your unfaithfulness does not define you. Your lust does not define you. Who you've stolen from does not define you. Understand that. how you have murdered, whether your words are with your hands, does not define you any longer. The idols that you've had in your life, they're not defining. The sexual mistakes that you've made in your life, they no longer define you. Understand that. Your pride no longer defines you. Because this battle between the real of my life and the ideal here in this mirror is not a battle, I have to tell you, it's not a battle that's going to go away. but I don't have to live in the bondage of the guilt and I don't have to live in the bondage 
of that of the shame of my life any longer and just pray that God would bring death to me so that at some point I could get some relief in this life. He has set us free. So what I have to do in my life is this. I have to let God draw the lines. And if God draws the lines, they're going to look a lot better than this, assure me. Because he's the one that created the Rockies and the Grand Canyon, so he knows what he's doing. I have to let God draw the lines. And then where I don't fill in those spaces, God fills them in with his more grace and his mercy and his love so that I am free from the guilt and the shame in this life. Paul says that I would not have known, and I finish with this, I would not have known, I have to, this is an important part, that I would have not, I would have not known sin unless the commandment had told me to not covet. It's the tenth commandment. Why does Paul in this verse simply say or refer to the ten commandment of thou shalt not covet? And can I tell you why? Because it's the only commandment of the ten that strictly involves our heart. All the others involve our hands and actions, but this one involves our heart. And I think what he's saying to you and I, and, and what we have to glean before we pray this morning is this, that we're going to go out from this, and, the, and the, the possibility is you're going to go out from this teaching this morning, and you're going to try to do all the things in life that you've been doing a little better, and you're going to work real hard, and you're going to find yourself right back in front of the mirror again, and the edges are not going to match up. And Paul says, because this is about your heart. It's about starting here. It's about the relationship you have with Christ and who's the dominant power of your life. That's where it begins. So for a moment, would you bow your heads with me? And I just want to pray with you and pray for you for a moment. Because truly, shame and guilt for the inability in our lives to meet the standard is perhaps one of the greatest works of the enemy in the life of a believer. Because we sincerely want to do what's right. But there is a part of us that sincerely wants to do what it thinks is right. And so we battle with the shame and the guilt of our lives when we fail and we don't meet the standard. And so what God says to you and what God says to me is this. Erase the lines because you've set the expectations. God says erase the lines and let me draw the lines. Let me draw the ideal of your life. And God says to us, I think up front through this text that that you're not going to fill in the spaces, that you're not going to line up, you're human, and, and you're fallible, and you're imperfect, but yet, I'll fill in the places where the lines don't match with my love, and with my grace, and my acceptance, and my forgiveness for you in life. So, dispel the idea from the enemy that the only way that you'll ever be free in this world is to die. Jesus says that I've come to bring you life and life more abundantly. Father, open our hearts and our minds. Father, you know this is a huge battlefield for many of us in life that, God, we are struggling every day with being good enough to please someone else and God to please you and so we battle with this continually God to searching for our acceptance and our worth in life and to be good enough and God you have established that that Lord the reality is you are enough father in our life that you are more than enough for all of us in this room today and in that we rest and that we find freedom from guilt and shame that we're no longer bound to those things. But you have set us free, God. And this is about growth. This is about the contrast 
of our life, our real and our ideal, God. But yet that shows your love within our life that you are here to bring growth to us. So, Father, work in our hearts, in our lives. And I give you thanks. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, whether you're sitting here in the building on campus or you're joining us through church at home, I want you to do something, and I know this is a bold move for you, and then we're going to sing and let you go, but we're going to keep the lights down because we want you to have anonymity, but we want this to be between you and God this morning. But you say, Mark, would you pray for me? And today I'm making a bold step by just saying this to God that I'm struggling with worth and acceptance. And I know that I've not met the standard in so many areas of my life. And I don't want to deal with the regret. And I don't want to re- deal with the shame. And I don't want to deal with the guilt any longer. So, Lord, I'm asking God to help me this morning. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if that's you, just by a moment of faith in your life, would you put your hand up and say, that's me, Mark? Yes. Amen. Yes. Thank you. Even though I can't see all of you because the lights, that's not important. God sees you. And it's a moment of faith within your life. It's that moment where, well, it's like Abraham. That what was credited to him was credited to him because of faith. And it's your faith to say, I know God can free me from this. So I'm trusting God today. And I believe in God for freedom in my life. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your goodness in our life, Lord. That you meet us right where we are. And you bring deliverance from fear. And from regret. And from shame. And from guilt. In this life. Now for us. In your name we pray.